Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 31st of August, the last day of a beautiful month of August. We're heading into fall, and I love it. You know what that means, folks? Football season. But more important, before we get to that, maybe a little bit colder weather. Maybe energy prices continue to move higher. Oil's been holding up very well this year. We're bringing in a guest uh, this show, Ed Kovaluk. He is the CEO of Prairie Operating Company. We're going to talk about oil, uh, where the demand is going, and why we need oil to get to clean energy in the future. All this and more coming up right now on Making Money. NVIDIA may be America's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone. But if you're holding NVIDIA, or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the $7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular in many news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC and built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed by on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found NVIDIA at the start of 2023, before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from NVIDIA. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, is what Mark says. In fact, it just flashed by on a totally different AI stock. And today, he'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at www.aifrenzy23.com. Again, that's aifrenzy23.com for a free copy of his new report. Again, this is Matt McCall. Welcome to Making Money. It's the 31st of August, 2023. Still here up in the Baltimore studio, the main office, the headquarters. Uh, enjoying uh, being in what they call Charm City. Uh, so enjoying my food and my stay here. And uh, we'll be here for another week or so. Uh, but we have a big show coming up. And as I mentioned, uh, we have an interview uh, with uh, Ed Kovalik. He is the CEO of Prairie Operating Company, which is an oil and gas company. And we're going to talk to him about the state of the energy markets today uh, and, and where he thinks it's going and uh, get my views on that as well. And uh, how it's very important that we still need oil and gas in this country to reach the goals of renewable energy uh, that the government and many companies uh, around the world have set. Uh, So we'll get to that in a minute. Before I do that, just three quick hits, three news stories I think are very important we need to talk about. You know, earlier this week, uh, Federal Appeals Court came out, uh, and this was on Tuesday, and they said that the SEC uh, must review, must review Grayscale's application to convert its uh, Bitcoin trust into an exchange traded fund, into an ETF. And as you know, we talked about a couple months ago, uh, BlackRock, uh, the world's largest money manager, uh, recently applied for a Bitcoin spot ETF. And that pushed the price of Bitcoin up. It's since come down. This news came out on Tuesday. Uh, after the news, uh, Bitcoin jumped over about over $2,000. Uh, it's now come down a little bit, but it's still above 27000 right now. Um, Coinbase, a couple of the other um, crypto-related stocks all jumped on this news. But this is extremely important, not just for Grayscale, but for the future of Bitcoin and the potential future of a, a Bitcoin spot ETF. And, you know, reading through this, there's a couple of things in here I thought were pretty fascinating. Uh, the SEC came out. They did not provide enough information. They said SEC did not provide enough information to show how Grayscale's application or Bitcoin ETF was not material, materially similar to a futures-based fund that the agency, that being the SEC, already approved. I've been saying this for a long time. The SEC went out and proved a futures-based Bitcoin ETF, but not a spot-based. Grayscale, this trust has been around a long time. They have the Bitcoin backing up. They've been able to follow the rules just to prove the damn thing. The SEC is playing games. They're playing God and saying, you know, we're going to pick and choose. Thank goodness somebody in the court system stepping up, making the SEC do their damn job. So get out there and do your work. Do your due diligence. And you can't tell me that a futures-based Bitcoin ETF is any less risky than a spot. It's just not true. So either you're that uneducated, which could be true, 
uh, it is a government agency, or you just have it out and, and you just have your views on, on Bitcoin. You don't want it to get passed. Either way, they will be forced at some point, in my opinion, to pass it. And when it does get passed, and, and, and whether it's Grayscale or BlackRock or Fidelity or all of the above, uh, it will be good for Bitcoin. And, and that when that day happens, you're going to see Bitcoin just start a new slow uh, bull market from there. So that was some big news. Um, also, this morning came out uh, the PCE, and that is uh, the Fed's uh, preferred inflation indicator. Month over month, this is for the number of July, month over month up 0.2%. That's the core. Um, year over year up 4.2%, a little bit higher than the 4.1 in June. Uh, most of this was expected. Uh, the headline number was up 3.3% year over year, uh, up from 3% in June. Again, expected. So I don't think this is going to sway the Fed very much in either direction uh, as to what they decide to do. And if you take a look at the odds, and, and these are just the, the futures odds of what the Fed will do uh, at its September meeting, uh, we're, we're still leaning on about an 88.5% chance the Fed does nothing. So an 89% chance the Fed does nothing. So I don't think this has swayed anything. It's still showing that inflation's come way down from where it was. It's not at the level that the Fed wants it, granted. Uh, but we're moving in the right direction, and uh, I think that's going to be really good um, for the market going forward. And I think you're going to start seeing yields continue to come down. And um, let me show you here real quick the 10-year yield. This this is an indicator, in my opinion, that I, I think the Fed may be done. Now, here's the chart. This is a yield at a 10-year. We're down about 4.09 right now. You know, we hit the highest level over a decade about two weeks ago. Uh, as you can see, you're about 4.3. And you see on the right-hand side of the chart, it doesn't look like much that's pulled back, but we are starting to weaken uh, the 10-year yield. That means uh, that bond prices are going up, and people are buying bonds, locking at that rate, which to me, uh, I had a conversation yesterday with some colleagues and, and you know, typecast, if you will, as a very aggressive investor. That's not true. I just like innovation. Uh, and it happens to be when you invest in innovation early stage, you have to hold for a long time. Uh, let let that, that that trend play out, come to fruition. Um, but I, 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 I made some people laugh yesterday. And I said, you know, I really think bonds are attractive here. And I thought I was crazy because I never talked bonds. Uh, I talked about this in last uh, Tuesday's show as well. I really think the bond market is very, very attractive in certain ways. So um, I may talk about that more going forward, but I think it's good for a lot of people to be diversified, not just in, in equities, uh, but have some exposure to bonds as well. Locking in now, I think is a really good, uh, good move. So... Before we jump into the interview uh, here with uh, uh, Ed Kovalec, the CEO of uh, Prairie Operating Company, I just want to show you the chart here of oil uh, year to date. And it's not a bad looking chart, folks. Uh, it's down slightly, uh, but you can see, you know, we, we bottomed in March, bottomed again, June, July. We've come up quite a bit from there. That was down in the high 60s. Uh, we're now trading at the um, low, 82, low 80s, uh, just below $83 a barrel. And uh, it's holding up pretty damn well. So I, I like the action oil right now. I, I don't think there's uh, anything to worry about. Um, there, there's also concerns out there from people saying, well, there's a recession coming. So, you know, oil prices should go down. I'm not buying that. I think the, the one reason oil is not breaking out um, with a lot of other you know, sectors right now is that Chinese factory activity contracted for the fifth consecutive month in August. That being said, China starting little, little by little to make some moves to prop up their economy and prop up their stock market. I think they're going to make major moves in the next six months uh, because they realize this post-COVID shutdown, uh, the COVID shutdown, and then they, they kept it shut down after COVID, really messed up their economy. And uh, yes, it's not growing double digits like it was a few years ago, but it's still one of the fastest growing large countries in the world by far. Uh, their economy is still growing. And a lot of these stocks are trading at huge discounts to where they normally trade, huge discounts to uh, peers in Europe and the United States. Um, and uh, I think that w when we see the government come out and prop up the economy, prop up the manufacturing uh, sector in China, that's going to have increased demand for oil. So that's going to be good. Also, just Wednesday, the U.S. Cr crude stocks fell by 10.6 barrels. Um, analysts looking for a drop of 3.3 million barrels. Came at 10.6 million, million, million barrels. So again, that's actually going to be good for the price. And then there's also expectations that Saudi Arabia, right now they have a 1 million barrel a day supply cut that they're going to roll it for another month. Again, keep the supply down. And if demand picks up with China, supply remains down, prices go higher. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing here. And then there's this. 
You need clean, clean energy, right? We all want clean energy, but you need dirty energy to get clean energy, folks. Hate to break it to you. The Energy, energy Information Agency, the EIA, uh, through June, saw the consumption of solar energy doubled in the last three years. We're now at 50 terawatts, uh, terawatt hours for the first time ever. Great news for solar. Great news, right? However, despite this doubling in three years, solar still only accounts for 2% of all U.S. energy consumption. Only 2%, folks. How the hell are we going to get to 100% renewable by 2050 if we're only at 2% solar? Yeah, granted, there's hydro out there. Uh, there's wind. Um, but... Solar needs to be a huge part of it. We're at 2%. And to put this in perspective, coal still makes up 8%. So to get there, folks, it's going to take a lot. And I'm going to show you another chart here. Uh, and, and this is a chart looking at um, clean energy uh, versus dirty energy. And that clean energy versus dirty energy, these are these, uh, two different ETFs. It's the XLE, uh, which tracks uh, oil and gas stocks, the large ones, ICLN. Uh, which is a uh, an ETF that tracks clean energy stocks. Look at the returns over three years. Look at the returns. Up nearly 180% to down 3%. Up 180, down 3%. That's dirty versus clean. That is why in our portfolios, we take the barbell approach. We invest in some clean energy because I believe in that. I think it's going to, it, the growth is there. I just mentioned it. However, it's going to take much longer than most people believe. So you need the dirty energy along the way. And you have to play both sides of that barbell. And I got to tell you, I'm loving that, loving that portfolio we have. And we're going to continue to push that and add both sides of it. Uh, we have a sore stock actually today breaking out to a multi-year high this morning. So I, I, I'm liking where we're sitting. And I, and I like dirty here too. I like clean. So speaking of dirty energy, we're going to bring on a CEO uh, of an energy company, a prairie operating company. So let's sit down and talk and let's hear what a man who's got his true boots on the ground in the oil fields, what he thinks about the oil and energy market right now. Here we go with Ed Kovaluk, the CEO of Prairie Operating Company. All right, Ed. So big gathering out here. A lot of people come to the, uh, listen to talk about the company, you know, Prairie Operating, obviously. Uh, what's the big thing that you got before we jump into it from the people that questions they've been asking other newsletter writers, other people in the industry, what sense do you get, you know, cause it's not an easy sell these days to sell an oil and gas company, you know, get people excited about it. There, there's a half that love it. There's a half that are anti anything fossil fuel. So what sense are you getting back from everybody attending? I think there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for, uh, folks like us that are genuinely trying to bring energy to uh, the market because the energy is short the market. Uh, you've, you've heard me spend some time talking about the fact that we're really walking into a bit of a conundrum with respect to supplying the market with oil and gas. As much as uh, the White House has been trying to suppress the price of oil by draining the SPR, as we spent some time talking about, yep. I'm not really sure that was very productive because uh, it didn't really work. And no. okay. what gas prices went down a few pennies as they yes. you know, take away half the SPR. Yes, exactly. And so unfortunately, I'm not the bearer of a lot of good news because I believe that prices are set to go up, which isn't really good for anybody. The way to promote production, though, is to promote companies like ourselves producing more oil and gas rather than demonizing our industry. But when you look at a lot of the economic factors that are driving prices up uh, between uh, uh, weakness in the currency, uh, weakness in uh, companies' balance sheets, focusing on hoarding cash and servicing debt as opposed to increasing production. The entire energy industry is sort of at risk of being short demand, um, which isn't good for people because they have to pay more for energy, which you know is inflationary and kind of defeats the purpose of the White House straining the SPR. You know, I, I always laugh at the argument when somebody tells me, you know, I, I'm against oil and gas, I'm against fossil fuels, but I want to pay less at the tank and I want to pay less for my energy bill. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that happen if you're lowering, uh, you know, the supply of something that's that's truly creating this energy? You know, how, how does that how does that match up? And do you struggle with um, trying to raise money and get people aware of the company because of that? I mean, or do you do you let them know, hey, listen, we're doing the best we can for the environment while we're doing this? Sure, that's a great question. I think that the industry has been un unjustly demonized for quite a long time. And the irony, as you state, is that the world is really truly dependent on fossil fuels. And so we just try to do our best job to educate the public and the fact that uh, the world needs our products. And 
you know, we're here to deliver greater supply. Um, now, at the end of the day, I think there's been a lot of misinformation sure. about this industry. And the truth is, is that we can produce the cleanest imaginable barrels ever in this country as compared to anywhere else in the world. It's American innovation, it's American technology that drives towards a zero emissions production paradigm, which is if ESG were truly a, an honest focus and honest dictate, that would be its mandate. And at least that's how we interpret our ESG responsibility, which is to produce the cleanest possible barrels. And that's what we're striving to do. And that whole ESG thing to me is a bunch of uh, BS because you know you have Tesla removed from the ESG index uh, who makes electric vehicles, which is kind of crazy. Uh, S&P last week removed uh, the even need for the ESG when they do their credit ratings. So yeah. I think we're actually, people are starting to wake up to what you're saying, that, that we need oil and gas. And I gotta tell you, I, I kind of fell into that trap a few years ago from the investing standpoint. I started investing a lot in solar and wind and battery technology, which has done well. But you know what's done better? Oil and gas companies. They've actually performed better than a lot of the renewable stocks over the last couple of years. We forgot about it. We forgot that we need oil and gas to build wind turbines. You need oil and gas to make the polysilicon chips that you need for uh, solar. We can't, we can't transition that quickly. So, you know, when you first hear about a, a company like yours, you know, a small company, pre-revenue, going out there, getting the permits to drill, you think, boy, you're going into an industry that's dying. But it's not. No. Well, look, what you said about ESG is absolutely um, true. And you know, you got to leave it to Wall Street to come up with innovative ways to raise capital and make money. And that's exactly what ESG yeah. is. But in and of itself, it's, it's non-productive. And so we don't let ourselves get distracted with any of that noise. Uh, we're great at making energy. The US oil and gas industry is really adept and adept at drilling wells, bringing on production, moving hydrocarbons the way they need to get to market. And that's really what we're good at doing. At the end of the day, I think Wall Street in other forms beyond ESG will begin to, to uh, really listen to what we're doing and get more and more excited about what we're doing because I think there's more than anything a new heyday for our industry to be had. Shale has been around for 20 plus years. It's been a great uh, re really revolution in the energy domain. Without shale, this country would still be dependent on foreign oil. Um, with it, we've been able to become independent. And you know, now we're a bit of, at a crossroads because our production is flattening out, it's waning. Um, capital availability is really waning. But to your other question, um, we're finding that there are still believers out there. There, there are really individuals and institutions that are contrarian in nature. They're not letting themselves get caught up in uh, all the misinformation that's out there. And we're seeing plenty of interest in what we're trying to do and a lot of uh, interested investors that want to play along with someone like us who's bucking the trend and wanting to generate a lot more energy. So where do you see demand going? I mean, there's, you look at the estimates and they're all over the board. You know, where demand for oil is going to be uh, and then supply as well. You know, do you think there comes a point where um, demand will outstrip supply? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we're heading there. Uh, I think that there's a lot of talk about demand destruction and there are a lot of policy initiatives in, in terms of driving uh, adoption of electric vehicles and other technologies uh, to, try to, to try to destruct demand in oil and gas, but uh, that's never really worked. And you know, I cited a great example in my talk earlier of how uh, even through the COVID pandemic, uh, which was the greatest exercise in demand destruction the world has ever seen. Uh, the world burned through all of the oil and gas we had in storage in 18 months after that fact. So demand is continuing to rise. It's always continued to rise. We don't really let ourselves get distracted with the month over month sure. talk or quarter over quarter talk. There's going to be a lot of volatility. One thing that's certain is no one's ever right in terms of their predicting of that, but over time, uh, the only consistent thing about the oil and gas market is that demand rises. So what about the supply side on the other hand? You know, you're in the, the DJ Basin, which is in Weld County in uh, Northern Colorado. I actually know that area. I lived in Colorado for a couple of years, went to grad school there. There's not much up there in Weld County, but obviously good oil. Yes. Um, what made you pick that area? Because that's not a basin that, that most 
the average investors have heard of. You know, they've heard of the Permi and a lot of others, Marcellus Shale up in New York, Pennsylvania, but not many have heard of that. What, what drew, you, drew you to that? Well, there were a lot of factors that went into our decision uh, to focus on the DJ, particularly Weld County, where we're at. First and foremost are the economics. You know, the, they're really uh, unmatched in the country. Everybody spends a lot of time talking about the Permian Basin, but when you look at the DJ Basin, the economics we achieve are no worse. The benefit we achieve is that everyone else is focused in the Permian Basin. <laughs> so we have availability of manpower and horsepower, and, um, and that makes our job a hell of a lot easier to operate. It also gives us access to pipelines and access to power. So we're not competing and stepping over each other so much as the folks in the Permian Basin are. Um, and so that's really what drove us there. There are other benefits to operating there as well, because uh, Weld County is a really welcoming environment in which to work. Uh, the county is very much on your side as an operator to try to promote tax revenue, as rightfully they should for the people living there. Um, but we also are looking uh, to put to work a lot of the local people in Weld County, which is, great. which is the other great thing about working there, because we can employ locals instead of having to bring in workers from all over the country, which isn't bad either, but it, it's great to be a local company, employing local professionals and using local resources. Good for you. Well, listen, I know you got the permits out there soon, hopefully get all ready to go, get those drills going. Um, you'll be doing some uh, changing at the name of the company, changing the symbol and everything. So you got a lot of, a lot of great things ahead and, and I wish you the best of luck. And, um, you know, America needs that oil and, and you're there to help supply it. So I, I think you guys are doing a great job and I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ed. Appreciate it. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.